welcome to section three. In this section, we're going to be creating our RTS player plugin. The RTS player plugin is essentially going to be our RTS player pawn. And we want it to operate as a standalone plugin. So we could just drop this plugin on its own into uh, the, any project and have a, an RTS player pawn. And by player pawn, I mean camera. And I'm going to go over what a pawn is in a second, but I just want to cover what we're, what the actual player RTS player plugin is going to going to be. So our player pawn doesn't have visual presence in the world, so it's not going to have a static mesh or a skeletal mesh or anything like that. It'll have a semi-physical presence in the world, so it, uh, it can interact with the terrain as you move around. But mostly it's just camera controls. So, you know, we want to move and zoom and it'll have an implementation for selecting RTS units in the game and commanding them. And also it will have a full modifier input, so like shift and all those combinations. I'm going to make it with uh, customizable settings so you can uh, set the move speed and the zoom and, and all that and then down the track we'll look at configuring them with player mappable keys and all, all that sort of stuff and you'll be able to configure your player camera controls. I'm also going to shift all that customizable stuff to a, a data asset so this will allow us to have like variable types of RTS player pawn so if you've got a game where you you know like you have different controls maybe you can't zoom say for example instead of having to go in and change the settings all the time you could just make another data asset where zoom is disabled and you sort of can just load anyone you want which also means that we could plug it into our game data and different game modes could have different camera cameras that you use as well and obviously we want it to integrate into our RTS framework like I said and that'll involve using an input interface. Now that will give us a dependency on RTS Core because RTS Core will be that thing we bounce back to. So when we want to use our RTS Player Pawn, we just need Core and RTS Player. We can drop them in any project and away we go. We've got a player camera that's fully configurable. And before we get into the coding, I just wanted to touch on some of the basics of the Unreal gameplay framework classes that we're going to be touching on. So the first one is actors. Everyone uses them every day when they use Unreal. The actor class is essentially the first class that can be placed into the world or it was spawned into a level. It inherits from your object, which your object isn't spawned into the world. It can be class instance, but it's not a physical thing in the world. Actors use actor components to add their functionality and we all would have seen that with things like the movement component and the static and skeletal mesh components that's and it sort of builds out the visual representation of the of the actor and the actor class is the first class also that supports replication and starts adding that functionality one thing i think a lot of people aren't aware of is if you for example go to into your editor and just drag a static mesh into the world it doesn't spawn a static mesh what it will do is it will spawn a, an actor with a static mesh component and apply that static mesh to that component so that's what's happening when you're dragging stuff into the world it doesn't really affect much not to know that but that it's worth noting so then the next class that inherits of actor is is pawn and pawns are the first uh, class that can be controlled in the world they make up the physical representation of the player or the or an ai and it determines how that player AI interacts with the world by providing that controller interface and handling physics and doing all sorts of other things like that. An example of a more advanced pawn is a, a character class. And it's already, it's just a, a pawn class, but it's had, you know, additional things added to it, like walk and jump and crouch, perhaps, you know, just additional things. But the core of it is the pawn class. And controllers control a pawn through possession. So a, a player controller or an AI controller can possess a pawn. And it's a one-to-one -one relationship. And I think I've mentioned it in the past that you can only control one pawn at a time. So in, in order to possess another pawn, you need to unpossess the first one and then possess the next one. So that's, that's all I wanted to cover. There's one thing I said I was going to cover, and that's the use of Git for backup. So I think now would be a good time that you should probably push your changes more often, which I'll try and do in the future. I might do it at the end of each part. But now's really a good time to do it because we're, we're going on to a whole new plugin and it's a new section. And let's just look how we do this. So these are all the changes that we've made in the previous episodes. So you can see 
all the changes, everything. Most of these are creating the class from scratch, which is that purple mean. This is an edit, so you can see we've added RTS core to the uh, project build.cs. Made some changes in project settings. Given that all this is for core, for the, for this push, I'd, I'd normally do push pushes in smaller files. It's just in case you have a mistake somewhere and you want to roll back, it's a lot easier to undo a commit. But for now, we're just going to get this caught up. So I'm going to grab all the files that are part of RTS core. I'm going to stage them. And then I'm going to put in here RTS core. So it's just this is just a description of what I'm putting up. So I'm just going to call this um, RTS core. Uh, and I'll put the description of um, what, what we've covered. So we've covered the uh, gameplay framework classes. We implemented uh, game data. And we've implemented the start of the game phase system. Now I can push this straight to the online repository, but I'm just going to commit this for now, so which keeps it local, and then I can push them all up together. So not, not that these are big files. Back to file status, and now I'm just going to push all these together because this is just all project related. So this is where we created all the classes for the actual project, not the plugin. So they're all you know related in that context. So this will be I'm going to call this project, like a bit of a name. And then uh, this is just the gameplay framework classes. And settings. We have some settings there. Which is, you know, when we assign the game mode, some data assets, it looks like. And then I'm going to tick this push to Origin Master, which will conduct the push here. So if you've never used Git before, uh, pull is bringing down the changes from the online repository, and push is pushing the all changes up. Um, if you've got more than one person working on a Git, you can do a fetch to see if there's any changes. So fetch will just tell you if there's anything up there. You'll come, it'll come up here with a number saying pull, those things to pull. But you always need to pull before you push. If, if, if you're by yourself on the Git like I am now, then there's not going to be anything to pull because you're just pushing. So, but if you've got someone else working, you need to pull their changes down before you can push yours. So there's our history. We can go back through and see all our changes. Very handy. Now, the other thing that we should do is when you're operating with a Git, you probably want to operate in a branch. So what's a branch? A branch is just a copy of of the, what, like it's called master here, but yours might be called something else. Here. Sometimes called main, source, uh, the different names for different, uh, depends where you, where you set it up. But so that what I want to do now is I want to create a branch into... Uh, from master. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna click on branch here and I'm gonna give it a name. And I, because I'm starting section three, I'm gonna say this is section section three. And it's asking me if I want to check it out. Check it out means copy like move to that branch. So I'm gonna do that. So now I'm on a completely separate branch. You can't really see much other than this has changed here. But as I push changes you'll see that there'll be two lines here saying that there's two copies. And then later when we're finished section three or we just want to, we're happy with it and we want to put it back in the master branch, we can merge it back into the master branch. The, the benefit of this is if you make a mistake or you need to get rid of something or your project implodes, you, you've still got the master back up as a copy and you don't put the branch in until you're happy with it. So master is sort of like your master copy and you're operating the branches in, it's like a little safe haven where you can mess stuff up. So that's all we've got to forget. Let's, uh, let's go back to creating this plugin. So in our project, we're just going to go to plugins, add, we're going to create a blank plugin, and we call it RTS player. Fill in some metadata if you want to, you don't have to, change it at any time and click create plugin. Right in the editor, we should have our RTS player plugin now. I come into source, I'm going to go straight to the build file and I'm going to add we're not linking to it yet, but I'm going to add uh, RTS core in the, I think in the private tendency now. You always want to do private if you can. So it'll t it'll tell us if it needs to be public later. In the public, we do want to add some some others. I'm, d I'm just doing them now so it's all together here. So we're going to need enhanced input because we'll be setting up input controls. So this will give us access to that. And I'm going to add, you know, that'll, that'll do it. And we'll just need enhanced input. We'll be setting up controls. So that's, that should be enough for there for now. Go to uh, public, we'll add a new class, and it will be RTS player, come on, put it 
into all choose pawn here and then we'll put it in framework wow. i just want to show you like if you have problems with your your writer after creating the plugin to clear the files you want to delete your sln intermediate and binaries that's sort of the minimum that you delete just the clear stuff so if you delete those files they're just the temporary files that it builds and then just right click on your u project and click generate visual studio project files i also have an issue so i had to do that thought i might as well throw it out right we're gonna we're gonna need a tick on this i'm gonna move that off public crap and then we'll just clean up the cpp file as well and all right so the first thing we want to do is add our spring arm and camera and the first one we want is a thing component so it'll be a component oh, it's cool. and for our specifiers here and our or our access we want to be able to look at it in uh, blueprints so we'll add the uh, blueprint accessible and I need a category. I think I might we'll put this in the private though and add the allow private access. To be honest, I'm not really sure why they do this with their components, but I've seen Unreal do it. So like I've been doing it under private with the allow private access. So I don't have a good answer for that one. I'm just going to duplicate this one uh, twice. Let's change. The component type so this will be the use spring arm I can spell spring add the forward declaration um that'll be our camera forward declaration for that then in our constructor we will add our constructor will add the object initializer And we'll add a primary tick. Start with tick enabled. True. And now we want to create our components. So we'll start with our scene component. And we want our scene component to be the root component. So we're just going to set our. This means it's the uh, top level one in the hierarchy. This wants to be included. Include. And then our spring arm, we want to attach that to our root component called setup attachment. Like so. And we're just going to set it some defaults on it. The arm length. So our whatever, 200, 2000. And then we're going to turn off the Collision test. We do collision test. And now our camera component. That wants to be included as well up top. And then for our camera component, we're going to do the same here, but we're going to attach it to the spring arm. Here we're going to add a bool for is initialized. So we're going to default it to false. And then that initialized is so in our tick we can stop it from doing updates. We haven't set it up yet, so we're just going to check our spring arm component valid, and we've initialized. Or we do our updates to our camera and stuff. So let's create a function for that, and that'll be uh, update camera. Oops, void camera. This is where the tick will update the cameras at and inputs and all that. Actually, we'll pass delta time in there. So delta time, that change. So we'll come back to this when we have something to update, but the 
let's take a look at our player input here. So this is where we'll start binding our keys to functions. So the first thing we're going to do is check it's the local player. We don't need to bind keys on uh, the server. And then we need some data here for what keys we're going to use. So we're going to create that now, come into public, and, and we're just going to create standard data asset. The U data asset, all of RTS player, input data. Yeah. We'll put that into framework data. So we don't need to override the primary asset ID like we usually do because this is just a data asset and it's not going to have any textures or it's just going to be uh, links to input asset uh, input actions and variables for the variables for the camera controls so it doesn't really matter if it's all the time not going to be anything major in here however it's data entry time we've got a fair bit to put in here so let's get started so these first this first section here i'm gonna put this as the input control parameters so these will be all the, the settings for our player camera and we need to be able to edit them in, in the editor because this will be when we create the data asset in there. And I'll put this under category parameters. And the first one will just be namespace. Now we can start duplicating. I'll copy it and then change the name as we go. Uh, edge scroll speed. will be rotate speed, pitch min, max, start zoom, max zoom, zoom speed, and speed. Right, that should do it for that. And then we'll create a new section here. And we'll call this the default in context. It's going to be all our input actions and the mapping context for our controls. Category to in context. Like this default. So, look, by putting the uh, pipe symbol there, which is the one above your enter key, if you press shift and that key, it'll create like a little arrow like like this or another section so here this is going to be our first link to enhanced input uh, if you haven't put that in the build.cs you might get links to the classes here the input mapping context and that's kind of we can just forward declare that and be a pointer to a mapping context or it mapping context oh. be the map priority That is used to override uh, other mapping contacts. If you, if you want to know more about enhanced input, I'll suggest checking out my uh, video series on that. And now we want to assign the default input actions that we want to have. So, and we're going to add a forward declaration, but also a pointer. We move. So this is essentially the key configuration that we're going to assign to this variable. Create that. We just got a bunch of keys we're going to assign here. This one's going to be look. Eight. And now command is mouse to click sort of when you want to tell a unit to go to a certain location kind of thing. And then create a new modifier key. Copy one of these. Talking marks, roll, and space. If you've got any other modified keys that you can think of that you want to include, 
like you know tab or something hold tab and do something all these keys sort of be used as you know keys that you hold and press other keys with that's what modifier means we down the bottom here we're going to add some templates so i'm going to put it in a namespace the rts player input actions sorry this has to be on the outside of the class in this file there we go. we're going to create a template so what's a template a template is like a template to create a function so you can specify uh if you're going to have the same function that has the same layout all the time and kind of does the same thing and you can specify a template function and, and pass that template to set up the function so if here we're going to have to show you what i mean find input if you haven't watched the enhanced input part this might be a bit tricky but the um i actually cover this as well in that i think but the inputs essentially have different types that you can bind to so you can bind to when the input starts when the input finishes when it completes when it triggers there's all different things you can bind to so what i'm going to do here is set up different functions to bind different keys to different inputs so for example this one we only want to bind to when the input triggers only we don't care when it completes or we just want to know when it triggers so this is what this function is going to do and it's going to take a enhanced input component or input it's going to take an action so it's a u action and then you can see the this these template parameters that we put up here this allows you to pass in parameters to structure the, the template so here we can pass in any class t is just a, a name for whatever we're passing in here so t is going to be a pointer to the object and function type will be the actual trigger function it'll make a lot more sense and very easy to explain when we start using this so now we can we can say if the trigger function is not equal to null because the, the trigger will be a pointer to the function and we can bind the action so on our input component we can bind action there it'll be the um, Sorry, I missed the actual variable name. So that'll be the action we want to bind. And then this is the trigger event. So this is an enum value. We're just binding triggered. So you can see there, there are all the different trigger types. Cancelled, complete, ongoing, started, triggered. And we want triggered just for this because it's trigger only. And the object and the function. So the object's going to be our player pawn probably. And the trigger function will be the function on the player pawn that we want to execute. So if we take move, for example, we'll have a function to handle our move data and we're just binding that to an action. So we're binding it to a key. I'm missing an include here. Yep, it wants to include the enhanced input component. Included input action as well. I'm wondering if we actually need these. Take them out, see if they can fix it. I think, yeah, I think because we've got enhanced input component in there, it'll have those references. Oh no, it needs a mapping context. Hard to spot those little squiggles. There we go. All right. So we want some other templates that we can use. So I'm gonna actually just gonna copy this whole one and I change it. So this one, I want to be able to bind the start event and the trigger event and the complete event We're going to have three so then all we need to do is pass in the three uh, functions that we want to bind to the, to those different triggers i'm just going to duplicate this call this one the start function the trigger function is good and this will be the complete function and then in here we want to do the the same thing but we just need to add those other functions I'm just going to duplicate this as well twice. The middle one can stay the same. It'll be start function complete function. And we just need to change the events. So it'll be started. And then the last one, I'm just going to copy the first one again. I want it for trigger and complete. I'll have two. 
this. And let's go back to our play pawn, our player input. Actually, we're going to need to set up uh, variables for our input data. So uh, put them under affected. I'm just going to put a little section here, keep it neat. Uh, call this the input data. And we'll have two variables for this. So we're going to have one which is the data asset itself, and one so be a U data asset. And we'll call this asset. And I think for now we're just going to set this directly on the when we, once we create a blueprint of this player pawn in the editor, we'll just set the data on here directly. Uh, yeah, late, later on I'll, uh, we might change that. But, so we need it to uh, give it uh, blueprint access. And we'll just put it to edit defaults only and put category so we can find it. Uh, settings. And then the other one we need is the actual, we just want to have a reference to the, the actual data class. So this, this data class, when it's been passed to the actual data. That's, and we can call a declaration for that. And we'll just call this input data. So now we need to take our input data asset and cast it to this input data and we'll do this in the player input component. So once we know we're local, we'll go, actually we might do a, an assert point here for if we forgot to assign the data in the blueprint. So let's do an ensure, uh, we'll do a message. So it'll print a message to the log like an error and we want to check our data asset valid. And if it's not, well then we're just going to put some text, uh, put data asset. On RTS layer. All right, so that's out of the way, and then we can go input data. So we don't need to do any uh, asset manager reference and, and get the data that way because it's not a primary asset. And if you're wondering why don't we do this for everyone, because it's just so much easier, it's because the primary data assets are laid to control what's loaded, whereas the standard data assets are always loaded. So in this case, because we don't have a lot on there, we're just doing it this way. So up there, and, then, and now we, we can go through to our standard sort of play input setup. So we want to get our enhanced input component checked. So we cast on our player input component that's passed in to enhanced input component and put that in a if statement. So, so sorry, we'll wrap this in, we'll check if our input data is really good, otherwise there's no real point going on. There we go. And now we can start setting our data. Break this up a little bit. The, the default bindings, modifiers, and you can add more keys in here as you go, just the start really. This is where we use our namespace and templates that we're talking about, so for ETO player input actions, and then you can see there we've got these uh, function templates. So the first one we're going to bind is move, and we just want it to, to trigger only, so we don't need to know when our move key is finished or anything, we just, when it triggers, we want to do the, do the function. You can see there from the hint that we have to pass the enhanced input component, which we called input here as well. And then we need our action that we want to bind, and that's what we assigned on our input data. So input data, and setting up move here. So move, so that's the action that we're going to pass through. The object is this, the player pawn, and we need to pass a function now that will be executed on that trigger event. So the RTS player, I could do class through. And we need a function. So I'm going to prefix my functions with input and then whatever it is, input move, which I need to create that. So let's do that. And we'll create a new section for these. I actually put them underneath these properties. And I'm going to copy all our input functions. And I'll just take this modifier. So 
Actually, I might make these virtual so we can, if you wanted to, you can have a child class of RTS player and override the specific input. Let's make it virtual. And we set input move. And then with the enhanced input, we want to pass the F input action back here. I'm going to include that. Usually struck, so I just include them. I don't do forward declarations. We can define that, and then that should be. Oh, this is going to want to include as well, is it? Oh, one's a pointer, one's not a pointer. Oh, I've missed a pointer somewhere. Not here. They're all pointers, so it must have been on the template. Really, stuff up that action, didn't I? Got the variable name and then I've got the pointer. Stop typing. Right, so come back to here. Now we're good. So that's our first input we can move. Well, when we set up the input actions. All right, so let's let's bulk out our classes here. Create some functions. Look, zoom, rotate. We're gonna have three for select and three for command. Rotate, reselect, hold, like that. Same for command, command, that's the initiation. Hold, command end. Command those. See this one. Modifier. This will be. Uh, alt scroll shift space Those. and we're also going to need some functions here for updating and setting the modifier like this I think I'm going to leave the, this video here. We've got a lot of functions set up and that's probably a good point to break. In the next video, we'll start implementing all these functions to get the input working.